Chapter 4 He Who Fights and Runs Away From his desolate loft, they looked even more pathetic. The Stooges, right there beneath them, mindlessly shoveling grub into their fatuous troughs. What a bunch of tools. He spotted Heather off at the cool table, cavorting with her new pack. She was a rare gem, lost in the supermarket of bullshit. Tragic. He licked his thumb, then raised it up to test the wind. Hmm, maybe. I can't believe that bitch keeps flunking me. If I fail, I have to go to summer school. Again. I fucking hate school. Vito complained. Yeah, she's a real cunt. Like you need math in the real world. Uh, duh. Ever heard of a calculator, bitch? Ever the champion elocutioner. Curly plowed another piece of farm-raised multi-fish into his yap. Hey, can it rain when the sky's blue? Larry cerebrated as he wiped his forehead. Dude, what are you, an idiot? You ever heard of a cloud? Scolded Vito, but then he put his hand up to catch a drop. Wait, I think it is raining. As they looked up, squinting into the sun like dimwits, they got a face full of piss. Neil was swaying his hips up above them. Spreading his gentle rain like a sprinkler. What the fuck? Grumbled Curly. Vito quickly realized who was benefacting their golden shower. You little fuck! Waves of laughter rippled out from surrounding tables as the kids caught on. There was no love lost between the Stooges and their schoolmates. Vito was a prick. He had it coming. Yeah, Neil! Cheered one of the nerds. Go, Goodman! Hooted another. Heather chuckled at their wet, flummox faces, but when she looked to the heavens, her mirth turned to dread. Vito would demand at least a pound of flesh for this transgression. There was nothing funny about it. Neil might be the smartest person she'd ever met, but he could have made a career out of self-sabotage. As they got up to flee, Curly tripped over Larry and fell into the table, sending their trays of food flying all over. Complete pandemonium broke out as the whole cafeteria leered and sniggered and busted out their phones. 21st century journalism at its finest. Vito moved out of range and took stock of himself in disbelief. Twice blessed, he was covered in lunch and doused with half-Mexican urine. His face flush with rage, he raised his fist. Oh, Looney Tunes, you are so dead. Uh Uh-oh, fuck. As Neil zipped up his tiny todger, he realized he hadn't considered an exit strategy. Heather watched her baffingly stupid amigo disappear from view. Run, Neil! She whispered, the only one at her table not guffawing at the spectacle. He grabbed his axe and jumped off the clock tower, back onto the roof. He slid quickly down the large ladder, and when he was close enough, dropped the rest of the way to the ground and took off sprinting across the grass. He was laughing hysterically, but he'd royally fucked himself. As he reached the rack, he threw the other bikes out of the way. He frantically spun the small metallic disc to 666 to undo his chain lock and took a brief look back towards the school. Where are they? He kicked up the jiffy and yanked his handlebars, but the pedal snagged on the spokes of his neighbor's rig. God damn it! As he pulled out the treadle, he heard the doors blast open and turned to see the three of them sprinting towards him frantic and enraged, pissed to be wearing his. They were gaining quickly, but would have to unlock their bikes. As Vito and Larry got to the rack, Curly kept after, and narrowly missed grabbing Looney Tunes as he pedaled away. What the fuck did I just do? Adrenaline pumped through every vein of his skinny body as he dug in and put some distance between them. Riding with his eyes swollen shut was weird, but he'd lose them in the labyrinth. He'd been riding those narrow trails since grade school. He knew them like the back of his hand. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Oh, you are dead, Goodman. Vito's angry scream rang out behind him. (laughs) Yeah, maybe, but not today, douchebag. Dust and pebbles flew from his knobby wheels. His thighs were burning as he quickly reached the fork, the dirt road roundabout in the woods about a quarter mile from campus, where the deviants gathered to smoke and escape the adults. There were a few stoners puffing on a blunt. They gawked at him slack-jawed, a freak show cyclops, guitar in tote, rocking his dumb hair and pedaling like his life depended on him. He twitched his little bell as he passed, 
Jason's mom had begged him to get it to alert cars to his presence. He'd grown to like its timeless ring. Rudy, a black kid he'd known since grade school, was there at the fork. Go, speed racer! He yelled as he hit the Dutch from under his hoodie. Neil heard them all laugh and chuckle too, foolishly invigorated by the chase. I'm losing them! In the passion of his flight, he could hear a dark, stupid riff, like something out of an action movie. He screamed like a lunatic banshee. Instantly, he heard a simple Motown beat. Up ahead, he saw the gnarled cypress tree where the labyrinth turned off from the wider dirt road. He slowed down briefly for a glance before dropping into the woods. Shit, they're still coming! Some dumb lyrics rambled into his head. He loved a good, simple song. As he pushed through one of the straighter sections of the precarious maze, he looked back and could see their small silhouettes behind him in the distance. Overwrought, he laughed at himself, a schizoid freak child wacko enough to be composing a song as his survival bumbled in the balance. In that moment, his existence felt like a Shakespearean comedy. Stop laughing! This is so not funny! He was breathing hard and fast as he pushed with all his might, his fear offering his legs a turbo boost of motivation. He tightened his grip as the path bent to the right and began an especially windy section he'd named the Gauntlet. I am such a nerd. He imagined his bike a small speeder with blasters on the side, like the one the rebel scum flew on the forest moon of Endor. In his mind's eye, he rose up above the trail and could see the whole ridge line beneath him. His bell triggered a laser cannon and blasted apart some pine trees, leaving behind nothing but a smoking crater. He spotted the stooges and zapped them with a lethal burst of red flames, cackling as their flesh melted, leaving grisly skeletons behind. Take that, assholes! Abetted by stress and fatigue, his fantasy grew more vivid until it fully consumed him and he forgot he was on the trail. He was safe inside his song, unaccountable to fate, free to exact revenge for all hurts past and future his imagination, his refuge from the cruel world. The sky turned a mysterious phalo blue-green as the sun darkened and began to spin like a whirlpool, sucking all the light and clouds back towards him. He leaned into a turn and headed back towards school, ringing his trigger once more. The clock minaret exploded, raining fire and debris down on the cafeteria, and he chortled maniacally. <laughs> a trailhead wound like a serpent through the chaparral switching back and forth through the foothill pines and leather oaks, but he was oblivious. Lost in his fantasy, he turned his speeder in a long arc and headed up high over town towards the water tower. He lined it up in his sights and rung his bell. The song continued as his cannon blew the tower to bits, sending down a deluge on the panicked people below. It was nighttime now. The sky was overcast and black. Beneath his craft was a grim vision, some apocalyptic future where emaciated vagrants waded through a river of garbage flowing through the parking lot of the old mini mall. They were scavenging for food and anything else they could use to survive. In front of the burning remnants of a big box department store was a refugee tent where children waited in line for injections of some weird fluorescent green chemical cocktail. Behind them was a tall, scaly reptile humanoid towering over a gaunt, cagey old white man in an expensive three-piece suit. They were shaking hands, sealing some sinister deal when Neil rang his bell, raining down fire and brimstone upon them, searing their flesh and boiling their blood. The children all looked up and cheered as he whizzed by and gallantly raised his fist. You can run, but you can't hide, good men! Vito screamed in hot pursuit, rousing him from his chimera. Fuck! They're gaining on me! He tried to focus on the terrain but was distracted by the sun, still sucking into itself like a black hole. Shrouds of clouds were curling around it, forming a diabolical face that was sniggering with delight. Its demonic eyes were red and infernal, backlit by the ominous glow. A wave of terror raised up goosebumps in his arms and neck. Concentrate, you loser! There was a dangerous zigzag and then a blind turn at the end of the gauntlet was quickly approaching as he leaned out to his left along the edge of a steep cliff. He was going way too fast and pulled hard on the brakes and braced himself, his back tire skidding out as he tried to change directions. Phew, 
That was close. Just as he began to pat himself on the back, thinking he'd slowed down enough to bank the last turn, he noticed a large tree branch strewn across the path. He pulled up hard to bunny hop it, but it was a big limb, way too thick. His front wheel caught and he went flying over the handlebars off the edge of the cliff. Fuck! He flailed his arms and legs as he fell into the ravine, but then a strange calm overtook him, and he relaxed as time slowed down, like a tape rewinding. It felt like he was falling forever, and inside his head he could hear the ominous voice of the cloud demon calling to him. Words echoed through his head as he wondered why he hadn't been horribly smashed on the rocks. Flesh and bones were intact. There was no crash, no pain. Some tractor beam, a blinding ray of light, had shot out of the vortex and was holding him, frozen in the middle of the air like a teenage revenant. His tormentor slammed their brakes at the rim and looked down to the bottom, a good 60 feet below. They were frightened, expecting to see a horrible mess of blood and guts, but instead their eyes nearly fell out. Emanating from the swirling dark clouds was a golden white beam of light, and at its end, floating like a freshman zeppelin, was the Looney Tunes, bike and guitar safely enveloped in a transparent blue orb. Behind the turbillion, an opaque black disc cloaked by gray clouds in a Stygian haze was hovering silently. The woods were eerily quiet as Neil stared at them like an adolescent spook, paralyzed by fear but inexplicably safe inside the blue sphere. No birds were chirping, no bugs buzzing. They gawked up at him, mouth agape, as a quiet rumbling began to emanate from the disc and a vacuum started sucking Neil backwards. Then, suddenly, the light flashed blindingly bright. When they looked up again, Neil was gone. The clouds had parted and the black disc was hovering there unobstructed. It hummed softly, a queer otherworldly drone as it lingered for a brief moment before taking off, accelerating instantly to an unfathomable speed. Suddenly, it turned towards the wall of the ravine, but instead of crashing, the saucer defied the laws of physics and miraculously dematerialized into the rocks. Vito rubbed his eyes. When he opened them, it was like nothing had happened. The birds were chirping, the bugs buzzing again. The forest was ho-hum and serene. They stood there dopey and mute, suspended in a trance, until Curly broke the supernatural calm. Let's get the hell out of here. 